Morning and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Herber, and today we have a webinar on five ways to boost sales, learning, and time to confidence. Uh, we have a number of people on the web today who have joined us, and so we'll actually be doing a couple of things today during our webinar. We're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. We've got some great speakers and some really good content, so we're going to try to jam a lot into the next 45 to 50 minutes and leave time for questions. For those of you who are logged in, uh, a couple of things. We, we will record this and make this available, so if you've got others who want to see this or view this afterwards, we can certainly give you access to it. Additionally, while you're viewing this, if you have questions, uh, please do on the chat box or in the question box, type in a question and we will gladly answer it as we go through the presentation. We're trying to make this as uh, interactive as we can. So with that in mind, I'm going to jump right into the content of this and talk a little bit about who we have with us. My name is Scott Herber. I am the Executive Vice President at VIA, and we have the good fortune of having a couple of really good speakers with us today, uh, starting with Julie. Julie Brink is with VIA and has about 10 years, over 10 years, of experience in instructional design uh, as well as e-learning, content development, has done a number of uh, different roles within the industry, and has a great background on the sales side of it, as well as different areas of e-learning and content, so she's going to share some of the things that we've done here and, and in her past life. Hello, everyone. Additionally, we've got joining us from the Midwest, Tim. Tim, uh, I'll actually let you, if you want to, give a quick introduction so we can make sure that you're mic'd okay. Tim comes with us from uh, Corporate Visions, who is one of the thought leaders in the area of sales messaging. Tim, you want to give just a quick hello and say hi to everybody? Uh, hi to everybody. Scott and Julie, thanks for having me here today. Good. Sounds good. We might have to have you speak up just a bit because uh, it's a little bit muted on our side, but it sounds good. Um, Tim actually has a book out called Customer Message Management, and it's focused on increasing marketing department's impact on selling by giving really customer-relevant stories and tools that people will actually use. So, um, And then uh, in the second book, it's Conversations That Win the Complex Sale, the attention is turned to salespeople and what actually happens when they're in front of the customer, um, as Tim says, which I love this line, uh, what happens in front of the customer when their lips are moving. So Tim's got some real practical experience in trying to make things effective and getting it in front of the voice of the client. So um, to make this interactive, one of the things we're going to do is, uh, you know, we're going to talk about creating customer engaged conversations, which is a big piece of today's, today's presentation. We're going to talk about aligning strategy and learning design to make sure that you know that the two are synced together. We'll talk about that, and then we're going to we're going to finish off with increasing speed to competency. So trying to get people as confident as we can, as fast as we can. So with that in mind, what I'm going to actually do is I'm going to get those of you on the phone to actually jump in here and help us with a question on uh, one of the polls I'm going to launch. And the poll is simply, how would you categorize your sales training? And if you see on the screen right now, you'll see a number of different areas. Um, would you say that our, our sales training is product oriented? Would you say it's some product and some customer orientation, mostly customer oriented, or completely focused on the customer? So if everybody out there could click their buttons and pick, um, everybody's pretty fast voting on this webinar, so we'll give you about a minute. What we're trying to get a, a pulse for, for Tim and for Julie, is to get an idea on where the audience is coming from, um, which is going to be really interesting um, because we have a variable number of clients that we work with. Some are very product oriented, some are very customer oriented, um, and today it looks like a majority are going to be right in that camp of a little bit of a boat. Um, but I'll, I'll give you just a couple more seconds to finish it up. Um, Tim, when you talk to clients out there today, are most of them still leaning towards the product orientation, or are they are they blended between the two from your experience? I think the challenge has been that most organizations are organized by product groups and product managers and product marketing. So there's just a natural drift towards doing things that are more product centric. While within the product training, there's some customer uh, sensitivities and content built in. The the design point is still the product, not the customer. You know, it's interesting because look at this. If you look at everybody who's on our webinar today, which is probably fairly, you know, we've got a little bit of data skew because people who are here are interested more in the customer side, but every single person on this webinar today clicked the box that said some product and some customer orientation. 
So uh, it's interesting that uh, you know we don't have the stratified that we normally get with some product people, some customer. The, everybody on the call today, Tim, is doing a little bit of both, but not as much as uh, one way or the other. So we can kind of address that when we get into it. Sounds good. So in the customer conversation, I think the key thing, and I love the, uh, I still love that line, Tim, of you know understanding what your salespeople do when their lips are moving in front of the customer is a great segue into the message and how that gets to the client. So I'm going to actually pass the baton over to you to talk about you know what the message is and how that actually resonates. Sounds good. So let me uh, let me close the poll here as I'm. Well, while you're doing that, if everybody is, uh, who's listening to this is um, in a position where they have a pen and a piece of paper in front of them, at the top of it, I would love for you to write the letter, capital letter I, and then put the number 2, and then the capital letter Y. So it'll look like I to Y. And it's just my easy reference to think about the role of the salesperson and the salesperson with their lips moving in your company. I is for the company ideas, the company investments, the company innovations, and all those things that the company does that you would call your growth strategies, new products, mergers and acquisitions, all those things that are supposed to drive the business forward. That's what the I's are. The Y is a customer saying yes. Eventually, for any of those I's to pay off, a customer has to go, yeah, I believe that idea is worth purchasing. Yeah. That investment or that innovation is exactly what I needed. But there's a big gap between I and Y. To get from I to Y, somebody has to in interpret, translate, and make what's happening on the I side relevant and meaningful to the Y side so that a customer says yes. And at the end of the day, we're finding that salespeople with their lips moving. I so like this it. This next slide here, as I'm trying to move it forward there, Scott, How's that working? Let me let me make sure you got it. Uh, there you go, Tim. Is that better? We'll see. There we go. This next slide kind of brings that home with a statistic, and I just think it's important for us to be able to back up that thinking. Uh, 5,000 business-to-business buyers were surveyed by the Corporate Executive Board, and those 5,000 business-to-business buyers were asked the question, when you choose one brand over another, what makes the final difference? And 9% of those people said that 9% uh, of the time it's price. 19% of the time it's their perception of the brand. The other 19% is the perception of the products or the service quality. 53% of these 5,000 buyers said that they believe this is the field sales interaction that makes all the difference. I'm sorry, I'm pushing it, Scott, and it's not going. There you go. Is that working for you? There you go. Let me figure out what's happening. There you go. So more than all these others combined, when your salespeople's lips are moving are when customers are trying to sort out which brand to choose. And what they said is price can become more or less the same, and, and they can get most competitors to the same place. Brands, now that companies have consolidated, really only the good brands remained. And so there's, there's not a lot of difference there. And the products, it's pretty easy to copy and eclipse each other um, from month to month, so the aperture or window of differentiation is limited. That at the end of the day, customers are relying still on somebody on the front line helping to sort out how what you do meets the needs of what the customer is trying to accomplish. So field sales interactions take preeminence when it comes to getting from I, all the investments, innovations, and ideas your company has, to a customer saying yes. I'm not sure if you keep clicking and I keep losing my, uh, my click there, but here's the next slide. So the question really becomes, so how good are your salespeople? How well is that working for you? And I think as you train salespeople to, to accomplish whatever you're looking for them to accomplish, you have to consider this. Customers have a view that very little of what is being said and what's being delivered when a salesperson opens their lips is creating any kind of commercial impact. In fact, according to that follow -on, uh, a follow-on question in that survey, only 14% of the people who were surveyed believe that what salespeople are saying is impressive enough or interesting enough to create commercial impact. 
I'm sorry. Right. I, don't, I don't know whether that's not working, so I'm going to try this again. Here you go. And then you should have you should have complete control. Try that again. Sorry, my bad. So there's the 14%. That means that basically what customers are saying is 86% of the time that your salespeople's lips are moving, they don't hear anything different, they don't see anything different, they're not sensing anything different than anything they're else from hearing from anybody else. So the challenge when you move forward with sales cycles. Uh, I'm sorry, with sales training is realizing you got a new biggest competitor. That when you train a salesperson to talk about your organization, many times you teach them how to talk about your organization in the context of the equivalent product or service from your competitor. And more and more what we're finding is that sales cycles, that, that message like that, are ending up in a big black hole called no decision stall dealer status quo. In fact, the statistics we see when we went out and surveyed companies' pipelines and their CRM system is that 20 to 60 percent of sales cycles are ending in no deal, no decision, I'm going to stick with the status quo. So the, we, we tend to think of what we're preparing salespeople to do is win the bake-off, that bloody, bloody price-oriented competitive bake-off where competitive matrices where you fill in the blanks with your features and your benefits and then you compare them to your competitors with half moons and full moons. That kind of training in terms of I know my products, I know my features, and I know how they stack up against the competitor are ending up more and more in this place of no decision, indecision, or status quo. So the challenge is that your customers don't see any reason to do anything different based on what your salespeople are telling them. And we take that back and believe that the training, the messaging that you're giving your salespeople are putting them in a position of sounding like everybody else. So the challenge is how do you do something different? What should you do different? And to make this make sense, think about the fact that six out of every 10 deals is going into this status quo black hole. If I give the rest of these four deals that actually turn into a decision and I give you two and a half and your competitors one and a half, you start to realize very quickly that the enemy or slash opportunity and how you train salespeople to sell is the idea that they need to be able to loosen, unseat, or unhinge the status quo and turn more of those deals into yours because there's not enough deals in the competitive loss column to make your growth number. So then the challenge really becomes what has to change in your training and the messages that you equip your salespeople with to get them better at escaping this black hole of status quo and thereby changing the dialogue in a way to impact your business more. And that is you need to message and train your salespeople on how to engage customers in their status quo and help them see the need to do something different before you can convince them that you are the better alternative. And most training skips right past that. It starts talking about why us, why our products, and why they're better. And a customer we're finding more and more when they engage companies is still trying to figure out, do I even need to do anything different? Or am I OK? Because I think I'd rather be OK. I'd rather not spend the money. I don't really have the resources to make the big change. So they're pre-sort of disposed to sticking with the status quo. And so unfortunately, most training and most messages that go with the training today don't do enough of a job of helping the salesperson first unseat the status quo in order to then introduce your solution. So we're re recommending that your training has a new kind of conversation in it, that you really kind of have the guts to equip and enable your salespeople to have different conversations. And the first part of that is, when you train someone, help them understand the customer's current scenario, the status quo, and where the potential leaks, problems, threats, risks, or missed opportunities associated with that current status quo are going to be. In other words, equip your salespeople to, in an engaging, insightful, and inspiring way, challenge the current assumptions. Be willing to show them a problem they may not even know they have or help on them understand the imminence of a problem they didn't pay enough attention to, or the magnitude of a problem that they thought was just a passing issue. Be willing to do that, and you've got to do that on purpose, and you have to build messages and equip salespeople to understand that environment and set that hook so that then they can begin to redefine the new criteria, the new purchasing needs or checklist, the new things that the customer should do different in order to avoid those threats, overcome those problems, and take advantage of those potential missed opportunities. And then, 
And then and only then do you begin to introduce your offering into that dialogue where you lead to the strengths of your solution, those things that are relevant and unique to this scenario you just painted and are strengths of yours, whether they're capabilities or certain capacities of your company, but they're part of this story chain where you first challenge the assumptions to loosen the status quo, you identify the new needs and requirements, and then introduce the strengths of your capabilities and capacities and change that dialogue. Changing the trajectory, both in the conversation, you're helping the customer see the need to do something different before you tell them about yourself. But when the dialogue then turns to you versus an alternative way to do it, you've had a completely different conversation and hopefully increased the gap or their perceived spread between you and the traditional competitive matrix. So that's a new kind of conversation that most companies who start with their products and even try to interject some of the customer insight into that product are already too late in because the assumption is the customer already knows they want this product. Now they're just trying to figure out if they want ours. So what's really interesting when you take this to another level is there's some research from Forrester out there that identified that executive buyers, these are executive buyers, not procurement agents, admit that 65% of the time they will choose to go with the company that establishes their buying vision, helps them see the need, and then helps them plug the gap. 35% of the time they will put it into a no holds barred, anyone can win bake off. Basically, these are statistics to finally validate that whole idea that we need to be in early and we need to be setting the spec. But now there's actual numbers to prove that that is a valid point. But back to my previous comment, that means a different kind of messaging and as a result, a different kind of training is necessary. The conversations you have with a customer to create a buying vision are way different than the ones when you're in the bake-off. The bake-off, again, is the competitive matrix. The buying vision is actually helping them see where the problems are coming from, what the problems are, how big the problems are. In fact, you're kind of helping them see around the corner. Customers told us in this last book we read, they said, I expect when a salesperson comes in and I spend some time with them, they see more people who look like me than I do. What in effect they're saying is, I expect that salesperson to have the knowledge, experience, the insight of all the collective companies they work with and solve these problems for, and that when they show up in my office, I'm going to benefit from that insight. And that insight means you as a company who sell to hundreds if not thousands of people who look like that one prospect should be able to tell the story of what's happening next, what's coming around the corner, how they need to prepare, and why your solutions have been perfectly aligned and suited to solve for that. Customers are actually expecting that you will help them have this discussion because, again, you see more people that look like them than they do. But it's a different conversation. It's a why change, why you need to do something different now conversation, not a why us conversation. It's more about the customer's desired outcomes, where they're at risk, and an idea and an inspiring insight for how to fix that not here's our company and our offerings and why they're the best or better than the competition. In effect, the customer needs to see you as someone who's partnering with them and showing them how you're going to bring money into the organization as opposed to just be the one vendor that'll take the least out. When they're on the bake-off side, they know they need to buy it and they're trying to figure out who's going to take the least amount of money out for the value I'm looking for. But when you're on the buying vision side, you're showing them how you're going to bring money into that organization, either by saving it or driving up revenue. It's a different dialogue, and most training, again, sort of prematurely jumps to the product and all the good things about it, and too many sales conversations don't start there. So the challenge is your company needs to equip your salespeople to share a distinct point of view. And this is very different than teaching them to go in and ask the same old 20-question litany of discovery um, when, when we surveyed sales um, buying executives again, they said, don't play 20 questions. I expect you to already know the problems I could be or am experiencing. The 20 question game is too much commodity. It's too commoditized. Everybody can ask the same questions and you haven't given me any reason to give you the answer. What I'm looking for is just a little bit of insight. Like throw me a bone here. Tell me something I didn't already know about a problem I didn't know I have. I might get excited enough to answer some of your questions. So the challenge is 
before you can dive into product feature benefits, even before you can play 20 questions, customers are expecting to hear something special. That's why you're in the room, and you need to share a distinct point of view. So what I'd like to talk about is what that looks like. Sorry, back one slide. The distinct point of view is an actual choreography. Sales training, when you put your sales training out there, you need to help your salespeople engage in this type of conversation and make it happen on purpose versus by accident. So it isn't really just being certified on product or even customer knowledge. It's really being certified on having the ability to execute a legitimate status quo loosening conversation. And it has a flow that looks like this. How can you grab their attention and, and make sure that that customer knows they must reckon with this sales call because if they don't, it'll almost be malpractice not to listen to us. Share some industry insights and facts and figures and, and um, other things that will get the customer to go, wow, this is going to be a different kind of conversation. I mean, we can almost predict with pretty certain accuracy the first six slides of every presentation you give your salespeople. It's the obligatory slides. How many years we've been in business? Here's what we do as an organization. Here's our map of the world and all our locations. And you know, here's all the issues that we hear from the marketplace. And here's all the logos of companies that have done business with us. And, and we think that's the prerequisite to having a great presentation, but it's really the prerequisite to parity. And the challenge is how do you early, quickly, tell that customer this is a different kind of conversation and share an insight or an inspiration to grab their attention and then show them the potential risk or pain associated with not dealing with that looming issue because frankly people move away from pain faster than they do toward gain. Show the emotional professional business impact of making a decision or not making a decision. Introducing a contrasting way to deal with it versus the way they're dealing with it today clearly contrasting the approach versus the status quo because value lies in seeing contrast and then proof telling a great story before and after how someone else just like them in a similar status quo went to the new way and alleviated the pain avoided the business impact and saw only the upside so a distinct point of view is a conversational choreographed conversation that you need to make sure your salespeople have competency on but then that begs for messaging to support each of these buckets. The way you build your messaging has to align with the skills you give your salespeople to have a better executive dialogue. So this becomes, if you will, almost a foundational idea for both the message development and the messenger delivery of it. The question is always, do these new ways work? And what I would just share with you is that we've done some work like this with ADP. And in the pilot of this new messaging, and the new skills to tell that story in a more impactful way. They went to a pilot region and they closed 145 deals. Now that may be no big deal. I mean, what is 145? Is that good? Is that bad? The big number is the next number. They deliberately went into their Salesforce.com system and said, where are the stalled status quo, no decision deals? And they said, let's try to reignite stalled deals. Out of the 145 closed deals, 115 of them had been identified as dead, stalled, or no decision. So they literally reignited 115 deals they'd kind of walked away from just to test this. And it, it, it apparently worked because in the 90-day pilot, they generated a 10x ROI on the entire program just in the pilot. And they saw millions of dollars of incremental business that they had written off to stall, no decision, or lost the status quo. So changing the message and equipping the messenger to have that left-hand side conversation changes the trajectory where you could have been stalled because they didn't see enough reason that they should do anything different because you look like everyone else to reconsidering the idea entirely. And the only thing that changed here was there were no product acquisition, there were no product development releases. The only thing that changed was the story and the skills they were given to tell that story. So. Um, I'll leave you with this. Back in 2000, did you know you had a music problem? And, and, and most of us thought we were pretty cool when we had our Walkman stereos because they were so much better than vinyl and so much better than tape. And if somebody would have come in and they had this MP3 player iPod in their hand and said, you need this, we would and, and, and proceeded to ask us 20 questions about our music problems, we would have said, I don't know, I don't have any music problems. 
My CDs sound great. They were way better than tape. Uh, I can, they're, they're much more portable than vinyl. I can take them anywhere. I got a 5 CD disc changer, maybe, maybe a 10 CD disc changer. That might be cool. There was no way you could ask enough questions to get the customer to realize what they really needed was a thousand songs in their pocket on something that looked like a credit card. But the buying vision that was created that allowed us to understand what could be done and accomplished because these were the threats and the problems we had with our current music convinced us we did have a music problem. Wow, I do buy songs I don't like. I wish I didn't have to. You know, my CD does skip when I jog. You know, I can't take all my music in my fanny pack. I mean, we all of a sudden started to realize we did have a music problem as good as we thought we had it. Building a buying vision and equipping your salespeople to help customers understand why they need to do something different is where you need to go next with your sales training. Scott, I'll turn it over back to you. So I think that's great. I mean, I think that the piece that you know we're going to tie into here pretty quickly, and, and I'm going to put some extra slides that you had in here, Tim, for us to come back to. Yep. Um, but I'm going to skip ahead on a couple of things specifically. So I'm going to come back to these in a minute. Um, but I want to align what you just talked about with the learning strategy and have Julie build on that because I think that one of the key things that we you know have heard is exactly the same story you have, Tim, which is. You know, too many features, too many functions, the channel's not engaged, they don't pay attention, there's too many products for them to learn, they're not engaging the customer. And so we're going to almost take a mirror view of what you talked about from Julie, and I'll pass it over to Julie, where from the distinct point of view, the grabber is very customer-oriented and specific, but you have to still know what those proof points are and what that impact is um, and what the contract is. So we're going to talk about how we've worked with clients to give them that foundation so they can link the distinct point of view to what they have to tell and take it from there. So, yes. Julie? Well, that's, thanks, Scott. That's exactly what we do. Is we start from the back and move forward, and hopefully we, we all meet and do it well. So, the middle. That's right. Uh, we work on the proof and the contrast, like Scott said. So I do want to show you all an example. I think that will help uh, lay it out a little bit more clearly. So um, we lay out the vision of what uh, the solutions could solve and the criteria for which they do so. So our example here is Hewlett Packard Financial Services needed to train their new employee. These employees are either new to HP as a whole or just new to that particular channel at HP. And they have to do it in a way that is compelling and engaging and in full view of everyone. There's typically, it's a global program, so they have many people throughout the world that take this program and it's a 90-day program that they have to be engaged in. <coughs> So um, to kind of work backwards from the distinct point of view, so the contrast part was that this program um, didn't exist in this fashion before. So you'll see here on the slide that we have multiple delivery methods and three key phases that the learner will go through. All their training previously had been done um, ILT, so this was a brand new way of thinking for uh, this particular group at HP, and they were really kind of bucking the trend. You know, they wanted to throw out the old and start with something new and fresh, uh, and the proof which we'll get to as well, was uh, time to competence. They wanted that shortened. And then also engagement um, in the training participation to be increased. So those were the goals, the shortened time to competence and engage the learners more regularly. And I think, you know, to kind of overlay the two, the two stories and the two vernaculars, as we talked yesterday, Julie, I think that, you know, what core provisions, what Tim has pointed out is regardless of what you're trying to sell, and oftentimes in training, and we get this, a lot of questions that come up on the chat side of how do, you, how, do you, how do you keep people engaged? How do you get them interested in the training side of it? How do you grab their attention? It's exactly the same as what Tim was talking about with the client, the customer, because in this case, our customer is that channel. Our customer is that salesperson. Our customer is that employee. How do we get their attention? And so, Julie, I know you're going to talk about you know, how you grab it, but this, I think, the HP example shows how before they even start, you had to grab their attention and give them something. Then you had to keep it and peak it while they're going through their learning, and then you had to find out a way to reinforce it and make it memorable. So the, the parallels are great from a training and selling because we're all trying to sell something, yeah. right? We're trying to sell people to do what we want them to do. We're trying to convince them to sell our products, and it maps exactly what Tim was talking about. Right. Before we got to that, we had to go through some process. And so I'm going to share the five tips for getting to that point. Okay. with all of you now. So your first one is to do your homework. And when I say do your homework, that means you need to do some research in order to best align and come up with a strategy with a solid learning design behind it. So when you do your homework, you have to research the people. 
who needs what, who are the, who's the audience that you're looking for, that you're training, what's going to motivate them. You know, so not only is it that specific channel, but just the, the audience in general. You know, how do you motivate these adults to take the training and complete it? Um, make sure that everything is relevant and whatnot. Also identify what works for them and what doesn't. Particular groups can have different desires and needs and expectations, so make sure you know what those are. Assess how they're going to get their, their information, the technology behind it, and then where they're going to get it. Are they going to be at home? Or is your sales team mostly remote? So do you have a variety of different technologies you can employ? Right. Phones, you know, the internet, are you going to do virtual instructor-led training? You know, where, where are they going to consume this information and data? So um, for the HP program, you know, we had to understand these areas in order to deliver all of these pieces successfully. So what we did next, the next thing you need to do is make sure you identify those learning gaps. So you've done your research, and now you need to figure out where the learning gaps and performance gaps are. So from your assessment, you'll find out um, some recurring themes or patterns that, that will come up. Um, so for example, part of the process isn't completed properly. Close rates might be low for your sales team. Um, or as with uh, HP, we discovered, you know, their credit applications were slowing down the sales. So what is it that we needed to do in order to improve the, the speed on that? Also, you will identify after in your assessment what opportunities there are, and then gaps in performance, and then gaps in needed and perceived knowledge that there are. Yeah, I think, you know, a great example of that, Tim, going back to your slide, is, you know, it's, it's a very difficult mind, uh, mindset to change to to engage on a business discussion in the first place. Even getting a grabber that really gets their attention takes a lot of work because you have to understand the business problem. You have to understand the potential impact on the organization and the pain of that group. And that takes a lot of work. And it takes a, a depth of understanding of potentially an industry, a client, a market, and a product and solution that you may not previously had. And each organization could have different levels of gaps in that. You may have a, an industry where, or a channel that really understands the vertical, but they don't understand the impact of what the solution has on that vertical. Or you may have somebody who doesn't understand a specific vertical because they sell to a geography. So they, maybe they don't understand the financial services market as well as they do the manufacturing. So how do you incorporate that and figure out where that gap is? That's very specific to your channel. It really is. And then you also definitely need to confirm desired outcomes and metrics, define exactly what you're going to measure from a a higher level program. So if your close rates, for example, are, close, are low, um, a metric would be to improve those rates from X to Y percent, you know, or improve the pipeline by product or the pipeline by solution, something like that. So really determine what it is you want to measure. Now, there are other more defined measurements you can take when it's um, particularly around a particular course or something like that. But this is for the program as a whole, right. your strategic learning program. Then what you need to do, after you've done that, after you've identified those learning gaps, you come up with your recommendations and strategy. So the recommendations will include short-term fixes. These are quicker solutions to potential problems or issues. You know, perhaps there's a misunderstanding on a particular product or a process, so short-term fixes can solve that. Um, some examples would be to send out some reminders on the sales process, send out daily tips through a mobile device or email. You know, prospecting tip of the week, some of these short-term fixes that you'll see an immediate bump up and improvement in performance. Yeah, if you go back to, Tim, to your comment on, you know, some of the grabber or the impacts in the organization, if the learning gap is we don't know what some of the industry metrics are, easy short-term fix is just giving them access to those metrics, right? What is the average decrease in turnaround time? How can we impact um, revenue for your clients? What are, you know, your ADP stats? Those are great short-term things that you can give a channel so they can relate that to their client and have that discussion that goes back left on your bar chart to engage early. Those are, those are relatively easy short-term fixes. Mm -hmm. They know how to apply them. Right. The longer-term fixes. Yeah, you definitely need to also employ longer-term fixes to make sure that your improvement is sustained. You don't want to just have these brief little bumps up in performance, right? It needs to yeah. be maintained over the long term. So these long-term strategies, uh, we'll address any systemic concerns and improve overall knowledge and change within the organization. So, for example, a long-term fix may be um, needing to re-engage the sales force um, and teach them more vertical or supply chain knowledge or something like that, like we right. did for HPFS. That's a long-term fix. You know, this whole program that we developed for them was not a short-term fix by any stretch of the imagination. 
Right. If you have an organization that's used to, for example, selling to an information technology group, and now you're saying we want you to move into the business side of it and identify where that business value chain is, you may have to re-educate and spend a lot of time and effort educating them on that supply chain, on that business impact, on the marketing piece of it, how it impacts their clients and where that pain is. And that's not an overnight transformation. That's more of a long-term strategic pull you have Absolutely. to play. Absolutely, yes. And so that's what you do next is you develop your strategy based on those recommendations. So nice segue, Scott. Thank you. <laughs> your strategy will provide direction for your overarching program goals, the audience, who they are and whatnot, and then the defined objectives. So once you come up with your strategy, you have to then define the solution. So it's getting more and more narrow as we go along here in these little pieces of this pipe. So um, the solution that will support the strategy, you need to come up with your creative theme. You know, so for HP, we did an around the world theme because the, theme, the audience was located throughout the globe and had varying regions throughout the globe. So it was one way to integrate everybody into the same boat, so to speak. Also, you need to come up with a program. And what does the program look like? What are the components? Is it going to be a blended program, strictly e-learning, mobile? How will you integrate social learning and various assessments into the whole entire program as a whole? And then, one layer deeper is you have to devise your tactical implementation plan. And that is where you come up with a programmatic flow for the program. Um, you integrate the creative theme, and then you boil down the implementation of each component and what information is best taught with each delivery method. So, for example, if you have a largely remote workforce, then one way that you would want to engage them and keep them motivated to take their training would be to make sure that they have easy access to information 24-7, whether it's through a mobile device or a tablet or that, you know, online, whatever it might be, make sure that there's lots of touch points for those remote workers available at any time, at any at any location. Right. Um, and, you know, so for example, in our uh, HP program, we determined that mobile was the first way to make the program awareness known. It was marketing for the program, so we did that first. And then we just looked at each and every little objective that we had and determined what deployment method would be best for that. Um, we also wanted to integrate, for example, social learning, so we integrated some discussion forums and we determined that an expert from HP would be the best person to moderate that, so the responses would be most accurate. So those are all pieces of the tactical implementation plan. And, and then I think, you know, we're tying back to a couple of questions, so I'm going to try to interrupt. We're getting questions from some of the people on the, the web, so okay. keep going, Julian. I'm going to jump okay, in here when great. I think it's the right spot. So. And then lastly, you need to plan. So you've done all of this pre-work, right? It seems like it's an awful lot, and it is an awful lot, but in the end, your the training plan will be well worth it. So define those deliverables and components clearly. You know, what does it consist of? There's going to be three e-learning courses, two virtual instructor-led, five mobile, six downloadable PDFs on a mobile device, whatever it might be. Plan those uh, deliverables and components. And then the metrics. You need to determine what needs to be measured and how you're going to measure it. You know, is, the, is strict course completion a good measurement for you? Is that what your objective is, is to find out? Or will you need to do a face-to-face -face interview or face-to-face -face assessment or uh, mentoring? Or what are, what are those metrics going to be and how will you get the outcomes that you're looking for? Obviously, you need to consider your time frame uh, and cost as well. So it's pretty basic in any learning strategy. Component, so. And I think, you know, one of the pieces that ties together nicely is, you know, everything kind of overlaps back and forth. And Tim, I'm thinking back to your distinct point of view as well. One of the questions that keeps coming up is, you know, how do you motivate a remote workforce? How do you engage a remote workforce? So I know you're going to talk about some of the mobile components, but I think almost if you think of it from a training standpoint, depending on who you are and what you're training, like we have some very large telco clients who have hundreds of new products and services. They are always scrambling from a product or solution standpoint to grab the attention of the channel and say, ooh, sell me, sell me, sell my stuff. So following Tim's, if you can grab their attention, mm -hmm. say this is what's happening, and tell them you have a problem but you may not be aware of it, and my product can solve that problem, here's the impact on what it's going to have to you individually and your success within our company, contrast that, and then say here's the proof. Here's others who have done it, here's, here's the revenue you can get, here's the incremental revenue you'll get from pushing our product. You're essentially using that same distinct point of view through the sales training to sell the concept of selling your product or service or your, your, your training as you are with any product or service outside the company. And we see that a lot with large organizations yeah. because they have huge channels 
and they've always got a conflict of getting them to do what they want. So I think tactically you're going to talk about how you get that time to competency going um, through a couple different mediums, yeah. but also just relating it back to, you know, we are in the training world, we're trying to convince people to do a behavior. And if you look up Webster's Dictionary, we're selling. I mean, we're really trying to sell people on the idea of doing something yeah. and what's in it for them. So I think using Tim's portfolio or his, his scale on a distinct point of view is a great place to start, which you've kind of laid out tactically how you do that. Yeah, so we'll go into the tactical pieces. And first, to increase your time to competency, the first thing you need to do is actually define competence. And what does it mean to you as an organization? Different organizations are going to have different definitions of what competent means. So um, traditionally, you know, competency is defined as a mastery of specific knowledge and skills. It's very learner um, and or participant centered, you know, something they have to show and demonstrate that they can do. It's more than just checking off a, a box. So you need, really need to determine what in your group equals competency. Right. And then you need to define what you're going to teach. And one great, you know, some of the very basic ways to keep learners motivated to take their training is to um, ensure that the information you're teaching them is relevant. You know, they need to know why they need to know it and then give them the information. A lot of adult learners don't want all the fluff that goes around it. They need to know, I need to know about product A, I need to know its features and benefits, and then how to best sell it or whatever it might be. Yeah, and I think that this goes back, really ties in nicely to the distinct point of view again, just saying, you know, okay, what are we teaching somebody? We're not going to go at them and say, here's a bunch of bells and whistles and, you know, here's what you need to know because they may lose sight of it. You have to go back and go, here is the benefit of why you need to understand this. This is what it means to you individually to push this or to help your clients with this. So you have to come at it as, as again, almost as a sale in convincing them. And sales people have a very short attention span, Julie. Yes, so I don't care what industry you're in, the attention span might be a little longer if they're in a deep technical <laughs> sale, but it's still short, short, relatively speaking. So how do you get to them and make sure that what you're showing them is practical and they can apply it? Yes. We also need to define the criteria of your program and allow people to work on things individually. People are going to come to you with varying knowledge and expertise. So you don't want to beat a dead horse, so to speak, and teach them the same thing over and over again. If they know it, let them move on and learn something different and new. Right. Otherwise, it's not relevant to them, and you're not engaging them at all. Um, and so that allows them to individually develop their skills. You know, someone new, newer into the sales area might need, need more assistance and guidance and coaching. So but senior people don't. So allow them to do it at their own pace. Good. Find out their own competency. Another great way to, um, uh oh. That's okay. We had a little, oh, there we go. All right. <laughs> uh, simulations are a fantastic way to improve time to competence because they um, really help people get into learning new concepts and procedures quickly and easily. You know, practice what you need to do. Um, Simulations are most effective when they're used in a similar environment to where they'll actually be used in real life um, because then the learner is truly immersed in what needs to happen. So initially, you know, I think when you think of simulation, you think of airline pilots getting trained in a simulator so they know how to fly to keep everyone safe. You can't really take a plane out to when you're just learning how to fly. So you have a simulation. And salespeople need the same thing. They need to be able to practice what they need to say, practice responding to a customer questions and concerns and arguments back. So it's really vital to use scenarios to help them create those customer conversations that Tim has, been, has mentioned. Yeah, I think a way to segue into that too nicely is if you think about from a corporate vision what Tim was talking about, they do a great job of simulation selling and, and applying the techniques he talked about. And But it's done with experts. And I think we find is, you know, having a simulation is great, a role play is great, as long as you're using a content expert that's respected by the learner. So if a salesperson sees a really good salesperson and they can work with them in the role play, they'll do it, or a person of respect and confidence. Candidly, if they see somebody as the product owner or somebody as, you know, from headquarters who doesn't have the experience, it loses the simulation capability. You just lose that linkage. So you've got to make sure you have the relevance. So I think if you go back to the HP example, Julie, you did a really good job of laying out a program. So even when you got to the virtual training side of it where they had that simulation piece, they had HP experts doing the course. That's correct. So you use the content experts and not, you know, somebody who just is sort of learning it themselves because right. they don't have that credibility. That's correct. Thank you for that point. That's fantastic. So net of it is allow your uh, team members to practice, practice, practice. So yeah. this is an example here on screen of a web-based training that allows them 
allows the learners to practice and engage and be immersed in a sales experience. Yeah, I think this is another way too, you know, I think one of the things, Julie, you do really well is you hit people multiple times with the same message but through a different venue, mm -hmm. so it becomes an ingrained behavior. So if you're talking to, back to Tim's analogy of you've got to grab their attention, you've got to get speaking about business problems. Well, you can do that with a grabber, you know, in a mobile device. You can do that with a simulation because yep. it, it plays into it. And you can do it with, even this has canned examples, and it says, okay, and I forgot the salesperson's name in this one, but Laura, she's, yeah. Yeah, she's going to show you three different sales, and you have to follow along. But by doing that, you get to click and choose the answers, and it pulls you through, and it reinforces that same process of doing it in a real-world example where you take a real sale, and then you tie it back into this. Mm -hmm. so you're not taking a theoretical. You're not taking a if you did. You're saying, right. here's what happened. Taking the ADP mentality of 145 new deals closed. Here's how Laurel closed three different projects learn from her because she's really good, and that gives you that credibility That's to get right. the stickiness Absolutely. going. Absolutely, yep. So um, to that point you were just mentioning, Scott, you need to make sure you provide training that can be seen, heard, and done. So uh, providing a blended learning type of program uh, allows the information to be digested in multiple ways so you can reach all learning styles. Um, and this is what we did with the HPFS project. We provided podcasts, we did mobile, we did web-based training, we did virtual instructor-led training, individual coaching, social learning. So we've yep. reached all of these, and self-directed learning as well. So we've reached all the different learning styles that are out there. A lot of that information is repeated, but repetition is the way to get people to remember something. Yeah, repetition so. through simulation and through actual examples. And I think we see a lot of, what's the term they were using in our big favorite telco, learning decay, like that was your term. So people do things when you're in those coaching environments and they're in the classroom where you teach them a new concept, but three weeks later you'll see them revert back to yep. their old habits yep. if they don't have a reinforcement mechanism. So although I love your dancing chicken, I think that's what we're trying to point out is you've got to give them a chance to do it do themselves it. and keep yes. doing it until it becomes a behavior. They're not going to learn those dance steps until they practice right. and practice and practice. And some of us will never learn those dance steps until we <laughs> try it we might. So. But talk about, talk about how you use mobile. I know okay. we've got about five minutes. All right, I'll speak fast. So mobile makes just-in-time learning happen. So um, the advent of mobile and the technology in mobile devices has forced us to rethink how we share information and how we consume information. So um, this means that learners can now direct their own learning experience. We just have to provide them the information and the data to do so. So mobile devices can support micro-learning, so short tidbits of information, two minutes yep. or less downloadable PDFs, FAQs, varying sales tips, um, you know, breaking news on a product or a system or a customer or whatever it might be. Um, gaming as well can be available over mobile devices. So the repetitive nature of the information consumed over a mobile device and then also in a game really gets the information ingrained in someone's head. And then as they're in a situation, they might think, oh yeah, I remember, you know, I learned about that in the last, you know, e-blast I got that I just read before I walked in the door. So um, mobile technologies are really important and vital, particularly for Salesforce because they all have a smartphone or a tablet that they carry with them. Um, and they uh, enable, the mobile devices enable our sales teams to be more effective and quicker. It really is just-in-time learning, so we really need to embrace it and use it. Well, I think the one of the things that we really learned by doing this a number of times is, and you've taught me, Julie, is that you've got to make it engaging. Mm -hmm. So they have to, you have to do it creatively. So you have to know who your target is. If you're looking at, this is an example from waste management mm -hmm. where they're selling a dumpster that's just a bag, right. which seems very straightforward, but using the tool to get that last minute proof point before they go into the call so that's they right. understand is really important. So you make it easy to access, you make it engaging because it's interesting and yep. it's visual. Um, and then you use it as a reinforcement tool because I think the game is a great way. Somebody asks, you know, how do you make uh, Salesforce, you know, really adhere to what you're teaching? You give them easy access. You make it engaging and you make it fun if possible. Yep. And Absolutely. I think you've got another example yep. on that. And I do want to state, you know, mobile is not a great tool for a standalone course, for example. So it's best used as performance support or additional information. Um, and a good grabber marketing and short little tidbits of information. But you don't want to put a 20-minute e-learning course on your right. device. That's not really that's right. not much effective use of mobile. Anyway, so let's switch to games for just a minute. Okay. Salespeople are inherently competitive. Would you agree? Yes, yes, I would okay. totally agree. All right. And what can be more competitive than a game? Right. Yes. Is a so, game that your peers could see you playing. That's probably well, the way. Even better, yes. <laughs> but even if someone's playing
playing a game individually, they're still going to be competitive because they're going to beat that computer, by golly. Right. So um, research has shown us time and again that um, games increase engagement and motivation. So they're challenging, competitive, and they provide an opportunity to really improve problem-solving skills because you have to think, uh-oh, am I going to go this way or that way, and what's going to happen if I go this way or that way? Um, and they also supplement the learning process, like you mentioned, Scott. So they're a really great way to reinforce um, what you need your um, sales team to know. They utilize multiple intelligences so that all learning styles um, like them, generally, for the most part. Um, <coughs> excuse me, and most people of all ages do. You know, depending on your demographic, you need to consider what type of game you're, you're developing, but right. games as a whole are liked by everyone. And gaming is micro-learning. You know, it's repetitive in nature, gets information, again, ingrained in the learner's brain, so they yep. can recall that when they need it. And I think one of the things, you know, if I flash back to what we talked about early on about, you know, using grabbers, using number plays, using word plays, understanding the proof points, understanding the impact, games are fantastic reinforcement tools for mm -hmm. that. If you're in a technology space where you have to remember different speeds of chipset, that's not something that, you know, right. you're just going to sit and stare at. But if you can play a game to do it, it's great for it. Or if there's, I think with HP, you know, they had a credit uh, yes. piece where they had to understand the credit terms used mm -hmm. with inside their organization. And those aren't things you're going to learn except through repetition. So having a game to reinforce yep. that is a brilliant way to do it. So you're teaching them without consciously right. being over the head. Exactly. Saying, so that's you know. what, yeah, thank you for that. That's what we've got right here on the screen is a way to teach the different terminology and steps of the process. So that it, they'd already learned it. The audience had already learned it, but this was a way to reinforce it. Right. Multiple times. Yeah, and they've got with the game here you did with HP, which was, you know, how do you get around the globe? You, you roll the dice or you hit the, and then you got to stamp your passport in each location. And if you got it wrong, you had to get another question. Yeah. And you had to keep moving until you circumnavigated the globe to get your passport That's stamped. Right. So it was a unique way of kind of looking at it, it's a yep. very creative way. Yep. All right. So basically the net of it is to increase speed to competency, consider all these different delivery methods and package them up into a program. Now, some programs, if they're smaller, you might only have a couple of different delivery methods, which would be just fine. But really do your full assessment and determine what it is that's going to meet my organizational goals and objectives. Right. So how do you hit them with each of these different pieces mm -hmm. with the appropriate information? But I think keeping it consistent. Absolutely. It's really yes. part of it. You know, so it you don't have to all be tied together with one big bow. So it would eventually all be in that box. Right, and that does take choreographing. You know, it's not easy to get sales management to agree to role play in the same scenario or the same type of, of theater that you're doing with the training courses. So you've got to get some buy-in from above yeah. and below, but you also have to make them engaging and you have to make them very real-world oriented by getting stories and success stories and impact stories from That's the client. Correct. A lot of research on the learning end in order to make an effective program. So I think, you know, in the case of time, I think we've answered a lot of questions that have come up during the chat side of it. Um, people have asked questions during the program. Um, I think that, you know, what we've shown, which is, you know, more interesting for, you know, depending on where you are, is how do you use the different tools to essentially engage the client in that customer conversation. And Tim, I know it wasn't as interactive on your side as, you know, we probably could have had because we could go on for a couple of hours here. But I think if you look at, you know, the relationship between what VIA tries to do and what Corporate Vision shows corporations to do or their sales organization is how do you engage the customer in a conversation that takes you out of the norm? And I couldn't, I passionately agree with your statement and the survey response or the findings and the research that clients more likely than not are going to do nothing today. And they will actually not just do nothing, they will dig in to do nothing because it's a lot easier to justify doing nothing than it is to spend and try to increase revenue or decrease costs. So, Tim, did you want to summarize anything briefly on your side? No, I would completely support that. And I think that, the, you know, the challenge today then is um, both in the content and then the, the delivery vehicles with which you train salespeople. What you guys have done in terms of a master stroke is recognize the, the just-in-time opportunity-specific learner that is the salesperson to make sure that, this is chunky in a way that they consume it when they need it and as much as they need for the moment that they're in. And I think that is very important. And then as a result, you need to have your messages be chunked as well. And that's what we tried to show in, uh, in the structure and the choreography is that there are piece parts to this that do have to be strung together, but you have to know 
the choreography before you just start blurting out content. Well, and I think, you know, one of the things, you know, and there's a couple last questions, you know, what motivates, you know, the learner to take the training? And, Tim, I'll give him my two cents, you give yours, but I think there has to be, the training has to be impactful and you have to be able to demonstrate that going through the training will help them accomplish one of their own goals. And you have to do that um, in today's world specifically or the channel just will ignore you, regardless of whether it's one or 50,000 salespeople, you've got to do that. What else do you th have you seen or what can you tell us on how do you motivate salespeople to go through training? Well, you know, we will measure things by competence, right? But that's just not a word that is in their vocabulary. They want to be compelling. They want to be really interesting. They want to have something to say that's different than everybody in what they're saying. So you have to show them that this is going to make them more compelling and being compelling is, is going to change the game for them when they interact with uh, the, the, the people that matter to them, the prospects and customers. So they're out there thinking about time to compelling while we're thinking of time to competence. And everything you do has to demonstrate to them how they're going to be more compelling. And, and by being more compelling, they're going to move the needle. I think that's a great way to put it because, you know, if I think back 20 years ago when I started in high-tech sales, you know, everything was about if somebody had a faster, cheaper, better solution, those salespeople loved it and they grabbed it and they ran with it, right? And today, it's, it's the same thing. You want to have a more compelling story so that you can get and differentiate yourself. And that takes a different spin on things, but you're looking for that same thing. You want to be able to impact the organization and you individually want to be more compelling. I think it's a great way to say it, too. Well, they, they believe they have their own, they're, they're their own brand in a way. And, and, and since it's up to them, that 53%, they, they're standing there and they want to be equipped with the, the goods to, to pay off that 53% expectation that customers have. So when you can fulfill that and arm them and load them up and uh, they see that as, uh, as, as beneficial that way, they'll, they'll take it and run with it. Well, I think to kind of to close out the piece on that, I think if you email us your top training challenge, um, you'll, and you could win a free copy of Conversations That Win the Complex Sale, which is graciously donated by Tim and Corporate Vision. So the first 10 people who send info at vialearning.com with, a, with a, 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 your top training challenge for your sales organization, you'll get a free copy of the book. So we'll make sure that we make that available. Um, additionally, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, this webinar has been recorded for quality purposes, just kidding, for uh, re rebroadcasting purposes. So if others who missed it today would like to download it or listen to it again, we'll make that available for us, and it will all be on our website. And we'll make sure that we follow up with anybody else who has any other questions. So with that, Tim, uh, a lot of fun putting this together with you. Great content. I really appreciate the research and the way that you approach this. Um, and we look forward to our next conversation with you on our next, the next time you and I talk. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Tim. Have a great day. And thanks to everybody for dialing in and listening today.